everybody. Welcome to the Underwater Photography Show. I am Matthew Sullivan. And I'm Alex Mustard. Uh, and today we have a bit of a technical one for you guys. We're going to discuss the synchronization speed of the Nikon Z8 or Z8. Nikon Z8. <laughs> I'll, I'll do I'll do the English pronunciation. You can do the, the funny <laughs> way you speak. Um, um, yeah. We'll let the, the audience decide which one of us is speaking correctly. <laughs> um, so I think this is something that's you know people have talked about a lot in on underwater photography forums, especially where every minutiae of technical specification tends to be exaggerated in conversations where it differs between cameras. Um, but I think this is something that is worth diving into because... Um, the Nikon Z8 and Z9, they use electronic shutters, which means they don't have any mechanical moving parts in the camera. And that generally is a pretty good thing. It allows some, you know, allows super high frame rates. It means that the camera doesn't have wear and tear problems on the shutter that other cameras do. You know, one of the first things people say when they're selling cameras secondhand is, what are the number of shutter accusations on the um, on the camera body? And of course, if you've got an electronic shutter, you don't really need to worry too much about that. So there's lots of positives that come from having an electronic shutter. But a current negative of the electronic shutter is it's limiting the synchronization speed um, on, on a number of cameras. And it seems to be sort of leveling out at about one two hundredth of a second. So that's the fastest you can shoot that camera with flash. Now, for some people out there, they're going, oh, my camera only does one, you know, one eightieth, one one sixtieth. I'd love to have two hundred. But I would say most of the SLRs that people have been using for the last few years did at least a 250th. Some of them did a 320th. So this downgrading down to 200 does feel like a bit of a limitation in the performance. And that's why people are discussing it. And that's why we're discussing it today. Um, and what we're hoping to do today is to sort of talk a little bit about who it might affect and who it won't affect and then run through some of the solutions, how you would deal with this as a photographer, so that you don't really need to think about it again. Um, so I think for me, the areas it's likely to impact on are when you are shooting in situations where you've got bright ambient light that you want to control, or you want to shoot perhaps macro with a relatively open um, aperture. And again, because of that open aperture, you're not wanting the ambient light to overwhelm your, your photography. Now, if you don't do either of those, you really don't have much to worry about. And I think, and Matt, you, a lot of your local diving, it's actually quite dark conditions and yeah. you probably never worry about these things. I could probably count on one hand the amount of pictures in the last like two or three years that I've shot over one one fiftieth of a second even. Because um, a lot of the freshwater environments are really dark. Uh, yeah. Blue Heron is very shallow, but it's dark. Uh, and I just prefer... Generally, I just prefer the slower shutter speeds. Uh, mm. I like being able to keep ISO super low, and I like a little bit of motion blur in a lot of my pictures. Um, and even when I travel, generally we go to cold water locations, which are generally a bit darker. We'll get into that a bit more later. But well, no, um, I think that's that's a, that's a really good point. Is actually, yeah, if if you are a cold water, green water, deep diver, that synchronization speed is never going to cross your mind. Yep. Um, I think what the people it's most likely to impact are maybe those that love their tropical diving, particularly yeah. that kind of white sand, classic blue water coral diving, where you're hoping it's going to be sunny every day when you're on vacation. And I yeah. think in those conditions, you are going to run a little bit more regularly into that shutter speed. If you yeah. are already a photographer in those conditions, you've probably been on dives where you've been right up at a 250th already, and you're going, oh, God, the sun's still too bright for my shot shooting yeah. wide angle, or you, you're wanting to open the aperture up for macro, but you, the picture's just kind of washing out with blue. Um, and in those situations, I think that that such shutter speed does become a little bit of a limitation, but yeah. for lots and lots of other types of underwater f photographers and underwater photography, it's really never going to even cross their mind. Yeah. Like personally, if, and the Z8 is a camera that interests me a lot. It's one of the, especially if the Nikonos conversion can work on it. Um, for me, that wouldn't even be a consideration really. Cause the, mm -hmm. like I said, the amount of times where I've found myself going up that high is very, very low. Um, so I'm, it wouldn't even bother me in the slightest mm -hmm. to, to have that limitation, uh, on the Z8. But like you said, if somebody's a tropical diver, they do lots of like bright, shallow conditions, that kind of stuff, then it could definitely be an issue uh, and something to consider or look at other options. Yeah, I, I was very lucky to be one of the first people to shoot the Z8 underwater um, last summer. 
And the trip before I shot the Z8, because I knew it was kind of coming up, so it was on my mind, uh, I was shooting with my Sony A1. And one of the reasons I chose the A1 is that with its mechanical shutter, it can actually have flash synchronization all the way up to a 400th of a second, yeah. which I saw as a, a big advantage to have that as a native flash synchronization speed. And the trip before I went to, to shoot the Z8, I was in the Red Sea, where it's, it's always sunny in the desert, the sun every day. And on that trip, I think over 25% of my photos were taken with a synchronization speed above 200th. So it wasn't oh. like it was every photo, but it was like a good quarter of what I shot on the dive and trip was taken at those settings. And so we were kind of discussing this in the run up to using the Z8 on the next trip. And actually what I realized very quickly with the Z8 is the best solution to that is just to make sort of a fundamental change to your camera settings. Generally, my jump ISO when shooting wide angle with the, the A1 is, is 320 or 400. All I simply did when I went to shoot the Z8 is I just dropped that jump ISO to two to, to two hundred, and yep. making that you know that adjustment meant that I was basically back into a sweet to spot range with it with the camera. You know when doing that tropical because I, I I then went on and shot the Z8 in the Cayman Islands in August, yep. so it was like super sunny, super bright. We went to you know Grand Cayman and Little Cayman with it, and in those conditions, just dropping that ISO down a couple of clicks really just brought that shutter speed range down a couple of clicks and just kept it in a really happy sweet spot. So that was really the main change I made. And one advantage of those, especially the Z8 and Z9, and I think the Z7 too, is they can go natively, their ISO can drop all the way to ISO 64, uh, which is really useful, especially if you're trying to cut out light because most of the Canon and Sony cameras, they have a base of 100. And they might not sound like a lot, but there's a big difference between ISO 64 and ISO 100 in terms of how much light you can cut out. Um, so one of the advantages I feel of the, the, those higher end Z cameras is being able to shoot at super, super low ISOs. Mm -hmm. Not only do you get really, really nice image quality, but then you also cut out a lot of extra light um, yeah. that you can't necessarily do with, uh, that you wouldn't be able to cut out just based on shutter speed alone. Absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's a really valuable tool. People, you know, um, and so there's a few other things that I would say go hand in hand with that. If your decision when using that camera is you're probably going to work a slightly lower ISO than other full frame photographers, it means you're going to be asking a little bit more from your strobes all the time. So I would say if you're considering the Z8 um, as your underwater camera, don't go into it without investing in some decent flash guns. And, and one of the great things of underwater photography in the last two or three years is we've seen a real proliferation of much more high um, performance flash guns hitting the market. And so there's a really good choice of stuff, but I wouldn't be going into that camera trying to shoot your wide angle with maybe some older generation flash guns that really don't have the, the guts behind them to, to be able to deal with that. Because the first thing you're going to find is you're going to be running out of, of flash synchronization speed. Um, so powerful flash guns would be my first um, bit of advice. Another thing you might want to consider with the flash guns is getting some flash guns that are HSS, which is high speed sync compatible. And this is a feature that's slowly creeping its way into more and more flash guns on the market. And what this does is these are flash guns that have clever electronics that allow them to synchronize with your camera at faster than that sync speed. So I think there's two points here. The first is that actually this wouldn't be my first solution because HSS isn't a perfect cure for everything. I'd actually rather just have, first of all, more flash power, but HSS, particularly for macro, is a great solution. And the way HSS works is it fires the flash multiple times during a short exposure so that you don't get any of that dark band at the bottom of the frame or anything like that, um, that the flash fires actually twice. So it, it lights the top half of the frame, and then as the shutter moves up, it, it lights the bottom half. Now. You might be, be wondering, how come if you've got an electronic shutter, um, do you still get the banding? Well, that's because the sensor is not reading the whole sensor in one go. It reads it line by line, and it can only do that so fast. And this is why there was a lot of excitement this year over the Sony A9 Mark III camera, because that's the first mirrorless camera, first camera anywhere that can read the whole sensor in one go. And what that means is you can actually have flash synchronization with electronic shutter at any shutter speed. And that's why that camera heralds a real excitement for the future in underwater photography, because, you know, 
conversations about flash synchronization speed will definitely become a thing of the past if that technology permeates into all the cameras that we're shooting in a few years' time. I got myself yeah, I properly the, sidetracked there. <laughs> <laughs> I think the A93 syncs at like one eight eight eighty thousandth of a second or something like that. So yeah. that's crazy fast. The, um, the strange thing is, is that actually in the very early days of digital, Nikon um, had a camera called the D70, which also synchronized any flash sync. Um, really? And was using an electronic shutter. Um, and it was only yeah. um, eight megapixel camera or six megapixel camera. But it was really cool that you could do that. And actually, I used that camera to do a lot of, to gain a lot of my understanding about synchronization and how shutter speed impacts things like sunbursts um, mm. and other aspects of the picture because I was free to shoot a really huge range of shutter speeds. And I was just really curious to see how they impacted on things. And a lot of the sort of perceived wisdom sort of actually got proved wrong by, you know, people say, oh, if I could only do this, I'd be able to do everything. And it, what was quite interesting is some things it made possible and other things it, it didn't make any difference, really. Yeah. So one other little trick that you can do for lowering uh, or for cutting out light if you can't get those faster shutter speeds is to use an ND filter. Would you like to go into that a little bit? Yeah, so a neutral density filter, I always explain to people, it's like a pair of sunglasses for your camera. It just cuts the amount of light down coming into the lens and, and therefore makes everything easier. And for macro lenses, you can get screw-on ones and they just screw on the front of the lens. You can even screw them on the front of the port if you have a, a threaded port at the front. Um, but even for things like fisheye lenses, most fisheye lenses and things like that have a little slot at the back for gel filters. And you can buy a neutral density filter that slots in there as well. So you can use them on all your lenses and particularly... You might think, oh, yes, actually, what I really want is this is a sunny trip to the Red Sea um, or a sunny trip to Roger Ampat where I'm shooting, you know, lots of shallow reef scenes and I'm struggling with the ambient light. A small piece of gel filter, which will cost you almost nothing, could be a massive saver on that. Now, the key thing is not to get too much strength in them. And neutral density filters have a strange scale, um, which um, every time I, I say it, I always get myself confused over. Um, but you have um, an ND248, or is it 268? I can't. Oh. Six. I think it's six. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, um, the four is, is, what, is one stop and the six is two stops or something like that. The reality is, is that you actually do not need very much neutral density to pull things yeah. back. What you're trying to adjust is somewhere around one to two stops. If you start putting more neutral density filter in, your sunglasses get so dark that it becomes harder to see through the lens. So you don't want to put loads of neutral density in. Um, so something like an ND4 and ND6 is just about right. It will just cut the light down a nice amount to just to keep those settings a little bit on your side. It is just the same as lowering the ISO, though, in terms of the end result. So, you know, I would always lower the ISO first because you have the ability to change that during a dive before going to neutral density. But if you know that you want to say shoot a macro shot and you're diving, you know, on a house reef somewhere and it's sunny, you're in Wakatobi and it's a sunny day and you're shooting your Z8 and you're going to be diving at, you know, 15 feet in over white sand and you want to shoot shallow depth of field macro, that would be a time where even your lowest ISO is still going to have too much light, ambient yeah. light coming in. So that would be a time when you might want to use a neutral density filter to help you. But yeah, i would just summarize that really by saying you've got the best solution really to having a limited range of shutter speeds is probably to move that ISO down. If you're moving that ISO down, it means you're probably going to need a little bit more strobe power. Generally, that just means you just, you know, you might want to invest in high, in, in strobes or maybe just use those full power settings a little bit more than you currently do and maybe charge your batteries just a little bit more than you currently do. But I think those are important things to bring into it. If you've got HSS compatible flash guns, that brings you a useful tool to deal with this, or um, you could consider neutral density filter, particularly for extreme situations. And remember, you can get screw on ones for your macro lens and gel ones to slot into the back of the wide angle lenses. And, and those all work very well. But I, I think my, my sort of closing comment on this would be that synchronization speed, yes, it's a nice thing to have. Yes, as an underwater photographer, a camera with slightly less synchronization speed does limit you a little bit. But I think if you plan correctly, 
And even if your diving is the type that it, it is an issue for, it really doesn't need to be a big issue. And for a huge number of types of underwater photography, it's no issue at all. So it's just something I think, understand the problem, understand the solutions, and it's not something to be concerned about really at all. Yeah. Well, hopefully we didn't put you guys to sleep with that one and you, and you made it all the way to the end. So if you did, thank you guys for watching uh, and we will catch you in the next one.